everybody. I feel sort of on an oblique angle here related to all of you. You're sort of facing there and I'm facing here. Nice to be here. Mark, thank you for that very kind introduction. We had a spirited uh, conversation at lunch about uh, some of these topics. Um, I can't remember the last time that I heard Philadelphia uh, described as a garden spot, uh, <laughs> but uh, having been here in the cold today, it does seem sort of balmy by comparison. Um, really, really delighted to be here. I was here uh, last year talking about Nelson Mandela. Um, I'm really grateful to be invited by Global Minnesota and the great work that uh, that, that organization does. So thank you for, for coming out tonight. As Mark mentioned, I, I spent a long time uh, as a journalist, and I was the editor of Time for seven years. And, um, and when I was the editor of Time, I didn't always know a whole lot about what was going on in the world, and I tried to make as much controversy as possible. And when I was at the State Department, I did know a whole lot about what was going on, and I tried to make as little controversy as possible. Um, I'm somewhere in between these days. Um, I still play a journalist on TV, um, but I'm not kind of in that day-to-day -day, uh, working of, of, of following the story, and, and I'm kind of relieved because I do think in this era of uh, the Trump administration, it's, it, it's, it's not an easy decision on how to cover uh, the President of the United States anymore, uh, even as a newsmaker. So uh, after seven years as editor of Time, I went into the State Department as Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. And um, maybe you know what public diplomacy really is. I didn't really know what public diplomacy was. And I still don't think there's a great um, definition of it. My favorite definition was the Joe Nye definition of, of soft power. It's not hard power, it's not kinetic power, it's soft power. It's the American ideas, American values. During the Cold War, it was described as telling America's story. And so I actually thought of myself as the chief marketing officer of Brand USA. And that's a very hard job these days, actually. Um, and I went into the State Department, and I, it was a little bit of like being a stranger in a strange land. It's, a, it's an incredible bureaucracy. It has 75,000 people in it. And, um, and two things happened within the first few weeks that I was in the job. The first, and the most momentous really, was Vladimir Putin's annexation of Crimea, his invasion of, of Crimea, his invasion of Ukraine, Crimea being the southernmost part of Ukraine that's on the Black Sea. Ukraine is back in the news, and we will get back to it, and it's, and it's uh, for reasons that are, that are dispiriting. And the other thing that happened was the first ISIS beheading of the uh, American journalist James Foley. These happened within about 10 days of each other, and they ended up shaping my entire time at the State Department. A lot of smart people before I went in said, you just find a couple of things that you can do and ignore all the other stuff. And that's basically what I did do, um, but by accident, because these were two kind of world historical issues. And, and part of being head of public diplomacy and public affairs is you're seen as, and indeed you are, the, the communications guy. And I got pegged as the, as the messaging guy, messaging as they call it in the State Department. And I always thought that I'm not, I'm not the messaging guy, but what I realized is that people in government don't really understand how important messaging is. And it's not every, every policy isn't about messaging, but messaging is a part of every policy. And in, as I talk in the book about trying to combat these two things, you know, that would often get in the way. So I think you remember how uh, kind of new and modern it was that, that ISIS was so seemingly expert in social media. They were on Twitter. Uh, they were on YouTube. Uh, they were on Facebook. And in fact, there was this little organization that was under me at the State Department that was created by a woman named Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State called the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications. That's another thing government is good at, very bad names and acronyms. <laughs> and, and part of it, this was created to combat a, a terrorist organization that showed also a great facility on social media compared to what other terrorist organizations had, and that was Al-Qaeda. So this little group was, was in charge of messaging against Al-Qaeda, and they saw the rise of ISIS. And I became sort of obsessed with this little organization and trying to figure out how we could counter that kind of noxious 
message of, of, of ISIS. At the same time, I, like everybody else, was completely outraged about the annexation of Crimea. I mean, this was, a, this was the largest uh, stealing of territory and violation of sovereignty since World War II. And if you remember also, the other thing that was outrageous about it is that for the first few weeks after the so-called little green men went into Ukraine, um, Vladimir Putin denied on the, on the public stage time and time again, he said over and over, there are no Russian troops in Crimea. It just was a bald-faced lie on the world stage in a way that was kind of breathtaking. And, and that wasn't the only thing that was breathtaking about it. What was breathtaking about it was seeing all of this social media messaging uh, that the Russians were doing to support Putin's lies. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I was in charge of the, the, the messaging and communication at the State Department. And I was trying to get everybody on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, I wasn't very successful at it. People were sort of reticent. They, they don't like to, you know, put their heads up and, and give their opinion. And there's pretty good reasons for that, too. So I thought, you know, I can't, I don't have any hard power. I don't have any missiles. I don't have any tanks. What could I do? I could tweet about it. So I actually started tweeting in these incredibly sort of bland tweets that have to be cleared by the State Department. I think my first one was something like, you know, Putin has violated uh, the sovereignty of Ukraine and you must restore Crimea to Ukraine or something like that. The same thing that my boss, the Secretary of State, uh, John Kerry, was saying. And I put out that tweet. And I noticed that, you know, it's bland tweet coming from the Under Secretary of State and it just started getting didn't go viral exactly, but I started getting dozens and dozens and then hundreds of comments, uh, retweets with people commenting on it, people with, with Russian-sounding names and calling me a fascist and a hypocrite and a propagandist, uh, saying like, you know, Putin had been saying that the protests in Ukraine that caused him to invade Crimea were, were orchestrated by the CIA or they were uh, done by fascists from, from World War II. Um, as I say, they had Russian-sounding names. Uh, they called me every name in the book and couldn't spell any of them. They had very, very poor grammar and poor spelling. And I, I, started, I, I wondered what that was. And you know, when I was editor of Time, I certainly got uh, attacked on social media. But it hadn't been quite like this. And we started looking into it. And so this was February, March, the spring of 2014. And we found out, and, and this was all in open source material, there was kind of fantastic reporting in, in Eastern Europe about this, that, that a lot of this came from the Internet Research Agency, the, the, the troll farm that was created by this crony of Putin's that was in St. Petersburg, which I think everybody has heard of from the Mueller report, because the, the first volume of the Mueller report was all about what the Internet Research Agency was doing, and his two indictments, the first one was 13 members of the Internet Research Agency. So it was a troll farm. What's a troll farm? A troll farm is basically a bunch of young people who are given laptop computers and given instructions, and we got hold of the instruction manual, assume uh, the identity of someone else, here are the messages that, that you're doing today, and in 2014 and 2015, they were the messages supporting Putin's view of Ukraine, that uh, the protesters were fascist, uh, they're supported by Hillary Clinton and the CIA and the State Department. And they were doing this. They were doing it in Russian. They're doing it in Ukrainian, other languages uh, of, the, of the Russian periphery. And, and it's like, hmm, this is not good. Uh, part of my job was to try to get our American view out there. And, I was just outraged by, by Putin's lies and the lies of the foreign ministry. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. And uh, as Marshall McLuhan said, knowledge is a barrier to new discovery. I didn't realize that you couldn't start something new at the State Department. So, <laughs> but um, I actually realized it was the, the, the second tier re revelation was that you can start something new. It's impossible to end something old. Um, but, but we started this, this counter-Russian uh, group, which we, we called the, the uh, uh, Ukraine Task Force. Because the idea was, 
how do we support Ukraine? That's the most important thing. And I just want to talk for a second about Ukraine and how important it is. How important it is to the, to the modern world and to the, and to the world of freedom that we helped create after the, after the Cold War. Um, Ukraine is a country the size of France in Europe. It's a hinge point between, between Russia to the east and Europe to the west, between the kind of autocratic leadership of Russia and, and the European Union. And our policy, you know, since World War II has been, how do we get Ukraine to lean to the west to become an independent, democratic, non-corrupt place because it is a part of Europe. And, and Putin's strategy is, how do we make Ukraine a non-functioning place? How do we turn Ukraine into a failed state? Um, the, uh, George Kennan, who was the great kind of philosopher of, of kind of Russian autocracy and Russian history, worked at the State Department. He was, actually became the ambassador to uh, Russia. He wrote a famous uh, telegram called, called the uh, Long Telegram by X, it was eventually published, about uh, Russian strategy. And it was the creation of the policy called containment, which was our Cold War policy. But in that, he said, for a thousand years, the Russians feel most secure when the countries on their border are least secure. And their foreign policy has always been to make those countries dependent on them, but also make them not function. So what happened when Putin annexed Crimea and then invaded Eastern Ukraine with those soldiers that were also Russian that he denied, who shot down the Malaysian airline MH17, he's trying to make Ukraine into a non-functioning state that couldn't ever be part of the EU that had to be dependent on Russia. So we started this group not just to kind of combat Russian disinformation, but to kind of help Ukraine do it itself. Um, I have to say, one of the, the, the strange ironies of what's going on now with this you know, canard and conspiracy theory about Ukraine uh, doing what Russia did during the election. I remember I went to Ukraine three times. It's a, it's a spectacular place, beautiful people. And my job there was like, how am I going to, I'm the messaging guy, how am, how am I going to help them message? And I remember uh, going there, and it was after Yanukovych, the Krutin pony, a uh, pony, uh, crony. <laughs> Maybe a pony, too, um, had, had absconded to Moscow. And so it was a new administration. Um, and they have a, a, an information minister, something we don't have and I hope, hope we will never have. But um, I went to see the information minister to say, look, let's, um, let me talk to you about how you can do some of this counter-Russian messaging. And I think it was his like, third or fourth day in the job. And instead of talking about counter-Russian messaging, he said to me, what's a press release? Uh, wh what do your spokesmen do? They, they um, part of what the Russians had done after Ukraine became independent after the fall of the Berlin Wall is that they want the, this, these countries on the periphery to be weak and, and unsophisticated. And, and, and the Ukrainians were. They're wonderful and proud and courageous, but this idea that they know anything about the messaging that was being done to them or how they could set up a kind of counter-Russian task force was, was way beyond them. So, so we set up this group. Um, it wasn't terribly successful. And we were monitoring what the uh, Russians were doing. And along comes 2015 and the American presidential campaign. Um, and we started watching what they were doing. We, were, we could see what the Internet Research Agency was doing, although, again, it's hard to see because they take other people's identities. And what we began to see is that they were pretending to be Americans. They were setting up uh, websites that were phony websites that sounded like news organizations. Instead of ABC News, you know, it would be ABC News Tonight. Or instead of, you know, the New York Times, it was New York Times Today. And they would create these phony templates that looked like, like real news sites. They set up, uh, I think people read about this, Tennessee GOP, which was meant to be an organization that was supposedly uh, Republican women from Tennessee, all from St. Petersburg. And now it's very clear. It wasn't so clear then. And, and, and the, one of the assertions that I make in the book is that what the Russians did in the creation of the Internet Research Agency around 
Crimea and the invasion of Ukraine, they basically transferred here for the 2016 presidential campaign. Why did they do that? They didn't do it originally to support Donald Trump. They did it to hurt and wound Hillary Clinton. In 2011, when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, there were the largest demonstrations in Russia around local elections in the history of the Putin era. Uh, demonstration, big demonstrations in Moscow, demonstrations around the country. And because the Russians can never believe that any political sentiment in favor of democracy or freedom or uh, independence can come about naturally, they have to look for an outside cause. And again, the cause to, to Putin's mind, because, of, because America is always responsible for whatever is going wrong in the world, Putin name-checked and called out Hillary Clinton. After the elections were over, he said, Hillary Clinton started and instigated these demonstrations against me. And I will have a response at some point at a time of my own choosing. Well, the time of his own choosing was the 2016 election, when all of these trolls at, 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 at the Internet Research Agency, at the beginning of the election, started creating false content and disinformation about Hillary Clinton. Um, during that campaign, when she had that moment where she almost passed out, they you know, started rumors that she was deathly ill. Um, they, uh, they used to you know, retweet and, and use hundreds and hundreds of bots, which was another innovation that they did, around the Crooked Hillary hashtag. That was their main purpose. And even when the, when the campaign started, when Donald Trump announced that he was running for president, I went back and looked at what they had done, what, the, uh, what Russia Today and TASS and other conventional Russian media had done. And probably for the first month or six weeks, they did what lots of people did. They made fun of, of this guy who uh, you know, announced at Trump Tower and came down an escalator and would speak in, in a kind of nonsensical way for you know, an hour and a half. Um, but as he started to pick up steam and started to win primaries and mostly started to talk uh, reverentially, worshipfully about Vladimir Putin and Russia and not criticize them, they started getting uh, around him. So they remained uh, virulently anti-Hillary, and then they started doing a lot of positive Trump stuff. And, um, and I think if people saw this in the, in the, uh, in the Mueller report, I'm just going to mention it because it's just such an extraordinary detail. So not only were they doing messaging in favor of Trump, they were organizing pro-Trump rallies. Do people realize this? So in the first Mueller report, he tells the story of how during the campaign, from the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, they organized a pro-Trump rally in Palm Beach. They organized it. They set up a website, you know, Palm Beach, people anti-Hillary and pro-Trump. And from St. Petersburg, they rented a flatbed truck. From St. Petersburg, they hired an actress in Palm Beach. From St. Petersburg, they rented prison uniforms and, and, and a kind of a portable prison. And they put this portable prison on the back of the flatbed truck and the actress in a prison uniform playing Hillary Clinton, all from St. Petersburg. It's crazy. Um, that sounds like collusion to me, but I don't know. What, what do I know? Um, but, it, but of course, it wasn't always winning. They did lots of other stuff that was also really pernicious, and we talked a little bit about it at lunch today, where they, they thought, like, like pretty much everybody, including Donald Trump, that he wasn't going to win. So you remember during the last few weeks before the election, he was talking about a rigged election. He wanted to get you know, prepared for what was going to be his next act after losing the election. Well, the Russians were doing the same thing. But the Russians were doing something even more sinister. They were trying to suppress the vote. They were trying to suppress, in particular, the African-American vote. They created all of these African-American activist sites, one called Blacktivist, um, with a number of names that sounded like genuine uh, American sites uh, to try to rec you know, recruit black voters. Uh, many of these sites had three or 400,000 followers. And 
they, they started telling people from the site, your vote doesn't matter, it's wasted. Uh, I actually read the other day about what they did in the last couple of weeks, told a lot of black voters, hey, uh, why, would, why should you wait in line, those long lines to vote? You can vote from home. Um, and then the final thing they did was, was not only tell black voters not to vote, but they're saying, if you're going to waste your vote, you know who you should vote for? Jill Stein. Now, I'm not saying this is causal, but if you look at the three states that Trump won that gave him the election, uh, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan, the margin by which he beat Hillary Clinton was smaller in each of those states than the number of votes that Jill Stein got. Um, so the Russians were, were kind of savvy about this. Um, I, the other thing that everybody talks about all the time is that supposedly how sophisticated the Russians are. Well, they're actually not that sophisticated. The problem is the audience, us. As I say all the time, we don't have a fake news problem, we have a media literacy problem. We're suckers. And so all, all of that stuff, the, the, the grammatical mistakes, the, uh, uh, the spelling errors, it's, it's not necessarily deliberate, but it doesn't seem to be a problem to people who are inclined to think of that point of view. I remember uh, consulting uh, a marketing guy when I was looking at this, and he said to me, I, I have an analogy for you. He said, you know the emails you get from the Nigerian prince that, you know, you, um, and they're filled with grammatical mistakes and spelling errors. And I said, yeah. He said, that's deliberate. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's a filtering device that if you're willing to believe that the person is a, Na is a Nigerian prince and you're not put off by the spelling errors and the, and the grammatical mistakes, they've got a live wire. They know that you're someone who is, is going to respond. That's the same way that it was with Trump voters, right? So, so if, the, if there are these people, and there was apparently 30% of Republican voters actually believed that Hillary Clinton was running a child sex trafficking ring out of a nice pizza parlor in Washington, well, if you're ready to believe that, you're probably not that concerned about the Oxford comma, is my view. <laughs> um, so, so, so in the book, I tell the story of this, of trying to counter Russian disinformation, not very successfully. Uh, we mostly missed it. Uh, the story of countering uh, ISIS messaging, um, which was a little bit more successful. But the, but the kind of unified field theory of what's going on, and Mark was sort of alluded this, how the world is changing and becoming sort of less free and more autocratic, was something that I, that I call in the book the weaponization of grievance. So if you look at what ISIS did, what ISIS did is they weaponized the grievance of Sunni Muslims who, for very good reasons, feel disenfranchised, feel left out by the modern world, have uh, leaders that, are, that they don't admire and governments that don't give them freedom. Uh, so by weaponizing that, they had a slo ISIS had a slogan. The slogan was, make Islam great again. Vladimir Putin, right, also weaponized the grievance of Russians. I interviewed Putin in 2007, and it was in that interview at, at his dasha outside of Moscow where he famously said, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And for him, it is a great tragedy. And for him, part of his whole rule is, how do we, how do we put the band back together? So essentially, Vladimir Putin's slogan over the last 15 years is, make Russia great again. Then along comes this guy, uh, Donald Trump, who is weaponizing the grievance of Americans who, many Americans who quite rightly feel left out by modernization, uh, left out by, uh, by the government that doesn't necessarily help them, uh, people who feel uh, rightly or wrongly, justifiably or not, that that they have this grievance, and Trump weaponized that grievance too. And what was his slogan again? Um, something very similar. So this to me is the, is the, is the sort of through line. And, um, and actually one of the things that I forgot to mention the, that, that is so dangerous about what Russia is doing is there's nothing new about it. What's new about it is, and this will bring me to what we can do about it, it what's new about it is, is social media. So 
for years and years, the Russians have had this policy called active measures, which is a, which is a term they use for information warfare, which they've used against us in the West since, uh, since the Cold War. But during the Cold War, they had to do the following. During the Cold War, if they wanted to make something up, like the CIA was responsible for the AIDS virus, uh, they would have to bribe a reporter in a little newspaper in India to write the story. Then they would have to get their Russian publications to cover it and then hope that the Western press would follow up. Well, now they don't have to bribe the reporter anymore. They can have people at a troll factory in St. Petersburg pretend to create a story. And then the thing that's also different about what the Russians do and is effective is it's a whole of government effort. I can't tell you how many times I saw during the campaign, and it's going on now too, there's a phony tweet from the Information Research Agency. It's echoed and picked up by Russia Today or Sputnik or TASS or any of the Russian television networks. And then very quickly thereafter, it's picked up by the Russian foreign minister and some foreign ministry and sometimes by the foreign minister himself. I tell the story in the book about how uh, there was a false story uh, that, a, that a Russian German girl was raped in a city in, in Germany. Uh, the Russian media picked it up and inflated this that she had been assaulted by Syrian refugees. And within a half an hour, uh, Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, was talking about this at a press conference. It's like, oh my God, they, you know, they, they're very fast. They're way faster than we are. And, and, and part of this whole goal of active measures is, 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 is big. It's to undermine the West. It's to undermine democracy. During the Cold War, it, there was a zero-sum ideological battle. There was our system, the system of, 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 uh, of independence, of democracy, of free speech, and freedom of religion, of open markets. And there was the Russian communist system. Well, then it was zero-sum. It was like our system or their system. We obviously won. But when we won, we kind of withdrew. There was the Francis Fukuyama idea that was the end of history. But the Russians got engaged. And the Russians got engaged. They started creating television networks across Eastern Europe. Putin, at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall, was a KGB officer in Dresden. By the way, not a very successful KGB officer if you're in Dresden during the Cold War. <laughs> and, but he saw that the, the, the Berlin Wall fell without a missile being fired or a or a tank crossing the line, it fell because of what I was talking about before, soft power. This idea that, that freedom and democracy is, is an allure for people. And, you know, and, and it was represented by the kind of stuff that we created, American movies, American TV. He came back and he started doing that same thing. The first thing he did as president was annex all of the uh, television stations in Russia. And what's dangerous about this is that now, what they, they don't say it's our system is better than their system because they don't have a system. What they're saying is they're just as deceptive as we are. They're telling just as many lies as we are. And what's scary about this and, what, and this world that we're living in now is that, is that it causes people to actually question truthful, honest, factual content as well as subscribe to conspiracy theories. That's, that's the world that they hope to create, and they're, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. Um, so the, the subtitle of the book is uh, How We Lost the Global Battle Against Disinformation and What We Can Do About It. And um, unfortunately, the what we can do about it is the shortest chapter in the book. Um, <laughs> But I just want to talk about it a little bit, and I think we'll, people want to talk about it during the question time. We, we definitely will. But, but first, just what is disinformation? Disinformation is, is deliberately false content, deliberately false material meant to deceive you for a strategic purpose. That's disinformation. What is misinformation? Misinformation is a mistake. You know, I've made, I made plenty of them as a journalist. We all make plenty of them. Sometimes they're intentional. Sometimes they're not. The third category is propaganda, and I think there's good propaganda and bad propaganda. Countries do it. Um, I've been criticized for saying that, but I do think that's a third category. But disinformation is the problem. And, and the reason why it's gotten so effective is that, is, is, and I'm not blaming the internet for it. I'm still a kind of internet exceptionalist. I still think the benefits far, far outweigh the, the, uh, the drawbacks, but the whole way that that social media works on the web is that the content is not created by 
professional journalists like I once was, uh, or, or experts or academics, it's created by you and me. It's by regular people. So, you know, how reliable is your Aunt Dottie in, you know, Des Moines when, when she sends you something? Their, but their whole economic model is about content that was, is created by regular people, which they then monetize. They take your information, they sell it, they send you ads, and what the, what the law says, the Communications and Decency Act, which helped create this, is the law said, and the intentions were good because they wanted to help these companies, but the law says, you're not publishers. You're not publishers like Time Magazine. You're not responsible for the content that you have on your platform the same way publishers are. They wanted to incentivize people to contribute. They didn't want the platform companies to become, to censor any material. And that was great in 1996, by the way, before Facebook was even created. It's not good now. And part of the remedy that I suggest is that these platform companies have to be considered publishers. In fact, they're the biggest publishers in the history of the world. And no, can they be liable for every tiny phrase that's on their platform? The, the scale makes that impossible. But they need to make a good faith effort to take certain types of content off. One is disinformation, deliberately false content to deceive you. One is demonstrably false content, like the uh, Nancy Pelosi video. I argue, and, they, and in their terms of service, they do supposedly take down hate speech, speech that, that attacks people by religion, by gender, by color, uh, by ethnic origin. Um, they, they, obviously, there are some types of speech that are not protected. Defamatory speech is not protected. Libel is not protected. But, but they need to make a good faith effort to purge their platform of this material. And I would argue it's in the best interest of all of us, and it's in their interest, too. I remember hearing someone on Facebook say to me, you know, we don't want our ecosystem polluted by this kind of content either, and they don't. But part of the reason they haven't purged that content or edited it is because they don't want to be considered publishers by Congress. So when if Facebook takes down the Nancy Pelosi video, a congressman's going to go, oh, you're an editor after all, and you say you're not. You're, taking, you're making editorial decisions. The other kind of false uh, narrative that they kind of promulgate is that that, well, we're not making these choices. Algorithms are making these choices. Mm -hmm. Algorithms are editors. <laughs> They're the fastest, biggest editors in the history of civilization. How you program your algorithm is an editorial decision. I al also argue that they need to be open about their algorithms and need to share them. And I can't figure out, you know, from looking at an algorithm, what the bias is, but there are computer scientists who can. We should know that. The other thing I advocate is a complete transparency about all advertising. You need to know why you get targeted with an ad. You need to know who paid for it. Uh, wh what is the information of yours that they sold that you get targeted with that ad? All of those things um, are really important. We can talk about more of them during the, the question time. And as I said earlier, you know, we don't have a disinformation problem. We have a media literacy problem. Part of the problem is that we're just not very good at telling the difference between what's fact and what's not. Uh, I quote a study that uh, Stanford did a couple of years ago that high school 10th graders, 80% of them couldn't tell the difference between a news story on a website and the clickbait stories or the sponsored content that's underneath it. I'd actually argue, if I'm a news organization, to get rid of that clickbait. It's just it undermines everything that's above it. People can't tell the difference. And I do think we need a kind of Ten Commandments of media literacy that should be on every website. And I think the platform companies should be spending billions of dollars to teach students in school, starting in elementary school, what media literacy and digital literacy is. Will that solve all the problems? No. Uh, will changing the legislation solve all the problems? No. Uh, but it will, it will solve a lot of them. It will take a lot of this stuff off the, off, off the platforms won't help for, for 2020. Um, there are things that are happening now that, we're, that, that are difficult to, to suss out, um, and we can talk about that during the question time. But thank you for listening. You guys have all been paying attention, and I, I, I look forward to your questions.